but I hope that didn't disappoint and you saw why I was overwhelmed by what the students were talking about. Okay, so now we want to get a little bit more practical and pragmatic. The conference is status quo no more, advancing the peace building field. How do we do this? So I'm going to start with you, Peter. Peter, who's on screen, who couldn't be here today. I'm not holding that against you. Uh, Peter, you and I talk about this all the time. You are the executive director of the Civil Society Peace Building, State Building Platform, CSPPS. What, what is this platform that we talk about when we talk about um, IDPS, the International Dialogue for Peace Building and State Building? We haven't had a big peace building document since 2016, the Stockholm document. That was eight years ago. So how important is this IDPS platform? I'm sure many of you don't even know what it is. Um, what is it? Why is it important? How can it push the peace building field forward? Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Liz, and, and good afternoon, everybody. And apologies for not being able to join you today in Washington, D.C., but to, to join you online. And, um, first of all, what a fascinating and, and inspiring opening session uh, you had. And, and these words that were said are still resonating with me. So I'll try to weave that also a little bit into my, my response to your question on, on what, is, what is the international dialogue, what is, what is it doing, is it relevant, what should it do? Um, I mean, it has been in a long existence. I mean, the international dialogue on peace building and state building is in existence since 2008 when, when donor agencies realized that aid uh, delivered to, uh, to countries in conflict settings was not uh, yielding uh, the impact that it was foreseen to have. And for that, it felt that it needed to come up with a solution that was more focused, more country-led, country-owned, and targeted aid deliverance to those countries. And that led to the creation of an international dialogue process, including governments of uh, so-called fragile and conflict-affected uh, countries, including also civil society, through uh, what later became the Civil Society Platform for Peace Building and State Building, which is a global network of civil society organizations supporting peace building efforts in fragile and conflict affected settings. Over the years, I mean, we have been trying to address the thorny issues of conflict and fragility and, and looking at conflict um, in country, but also global drivers uh, of uh, conflict and instability impacting these countries. And I think the dialogue um, has been manifesting itself uh, over time as a as an innovative, but also very relevant political dialogue mechanism, providing an, an open and frank uh, domain for discussion and discourse about how to tackle some of those problems. Have we been successful? I mean, after all these years of being in existence, um, the dialogue um, is, is not only, it's not really broadly known, I think. I mean, this, this, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, an introut who is engaging in that in the dialogue process and there's progress made, but it's not it's not uh, ending on the on the front pages of of newspapers. But then again, I do think that having the ability to have this continuous political dialogue process with uh, governments, but also with with interested parties to actually help and support governments to make the transition towards greater resilience and also includes civil society organizations in that process is an important segue for creating stability. And what we see in the current day of time is that this dialogue is now looking at the, at the potential we think, um, given the fact that there was a declaration issued, as you said, in 2016, when um, donor uh, representatives, governments, fragile uh, countries, civil society leaders came together in Stockholm and there's a need for a, for, a, for a recalibration of that international dialogue, looking at today's challenges, looking at today's uh, world that is confronted with what was said also in the introduction, 
multiple conflicts, and not only the Gaza conflict or the war in Ukraine, but I mean, there's over 55 conflicts across the world, and we need to be able to provide an, a reality and a solution to all these conflicts in terms of what we, what we can potentially do in, in supporting lasting solutions towards sustaining peace. That's the reason why we now are looking at, at the rethink and, and bringing in reality of today, but also develop new innovative ways and new partnerships in bringing that, that peace building and conflict prevention agenda forward. Back to you. So thank you, Peter. And I wanna give you uh, a big shout out. About two years ago, Peter called me and said, Liz, we're not walking the walk. CS, PPS, and AFP aren't really connected anymore, and we have to be connected. If we're going to, and Nick Haley, one of our wonderful board members, when we were talking about collective action, we have to walk the walk and be interconnected and working together collectively. Um, so that's what Peter and I do all the time now. Uh, and you know, we can say we have these two large networks working together. So. Peter, kudos to you. Shamal, you lead the largest peace building dedicated organization, and you grapple with these issues all the time. How do you build and advance this field? What are the challenges that you're seeing and the successes, and how do we go forward? Uh, thanks very much. And thank you to uh, USIP and Alliance for Peace Building and their respective leadership. Uh, for having me here, and, and uh, I really have a lot of um, respect and honestly love for the people in this room and the organizations that you all lead and, and are part of, and those who are joining us online. Uh, when I, the first, I didn't tell you, but several months ago when you first sent out the AFP PeaceCon notice for this year, I got it on my phone and I thought, well, that's not very inspiring because it pulled up a little wonky and it cut off the last two words. So all I saw was PeaceCon 2024, status quo. Um, <laughs> So now that I understand the theme, I've just changed my, no, I'm making light of a, a serious topic. Um, I think this is a really fortuitous time for this conversation and for this uh, global community um, because, you know, we're here in Washington, D.C. We have a very consequential election coming up, obviously. And I think no matter who wins, I, I really believe that this question of how to end wars and translate the ending of those wars to processes that can bring a, an enduring end to the conflicts that give rise to those wars is going to be the primary foreign policy challenge. Um, uh, and we're, we can see that with months long of failed efforts to just secure a ceasefire uh, in Gaza, uh, in Sudan, in DRC, just to name a few of the 55 conflicts Peter mentioned. Um, and, um, uh, and so I think those of us assembled here, diplomats, the funders, the, the uh, non-governmental organization leaders, civil society activists, academics, I think uh, marshalling the best of us to try to help answer that question, I think will be really uh, vitally important. Um, I wanna maybe stick you know, on your question list, it's maybe sort of three elements that I feel like have shifted and require us to really look in the mirror. Um, uh, the first is political, the second is institutional, and the third is about who drives this work who does this work. I think in terms of the political, I think the impact of the organizations um, uh, that, that advance peace building as part of their mission, being as reliant as we are on a limited number of politically aligned Western governments has always been a challenge and is becoming a real serious detriment. Um, this understanding is dawned on at the political, at the diplomatic level, we can see even in the darkest conflicts that we've seen, the limited breakthroughs that we've had have been achieved not by the absence of Western powers, but by their complementing and partnering with other partners outside of that uh, nexus. Uh, the, 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 the Black Sea grain deal would not have been achieved without Turkey. Um, the one ceasefire that got over 100 hostages released and more than double that of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli uh, jails released would not have been accomplished without Qatar and Egypt. Uh, even more recently, uh, U.S. Special Envoy, um, 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 oh goodness, for Sudan, uh, Periello, excuse me, um, uh, you know, in the convening in, in Switzerland, um, uh, um, would not have gone forward and didn't achieve a ceasefire, but did achieve an opening of a critical humanitarian corridor, wouldn't have been done without Saudi Arabia and Switzerland. Um, so at the diplomatic level, this is increasingly clear and, and recognized. I think it has to be recognized and filtered throughout the entire peace building uh, field. Uh, I had said this for some time and, and I found it troubling how many 
peacebuilding organizations rushed into Afghanistan on the heels of an invasion, and even more troublingly, rushed for the exits when, uh, uh, when, when uh, Western governments were essentially kicked out. Um, I'm not critiquing in any way any Afghan citizens who could and decided and were able to leave. That's not what I'm saying. But I think, um, um, uh, I think for an organization like ours, what this has meant is looking at the fact that we have headquarters in Brussels and Washington, D.C., and that's insufficient. Uh, and so on my itinerary, uh, increasingly this year, next year, is uh, trips to, multiple trips now to Qatar, to Kenya, to South Africa, to South Korea, places where we're looking to uh, significantly globalize our governance. Uh, but at the, up, at, the, uh, at the political level, I think this is um, important. At the institutional level, the multilateral system that was set up, the post-World War II system that was set up to prevent wars and foster cooperation, we know is not fit for purpose. There's a whole summit for the future coming up in a few days, a few hundred miles from here um, in recognition of that. Um, there are ways, while the momentum for serious and real reform on that pressure continues to build and get frustrated, but continues to build, uh, there are ways in which I think those of us in different positions can complement, even maybe jerry-rig the system a little bit to help it to do a better job. Um, I had uh, gotten a call almost exactly this time last year from Martin Griffiths, who at that time was the Undersecretary General, UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, who, uh, as people may know, came out of our field, came out of the peace, didn't come out of the humanitarian sector as much as the peace building sector. It founded the Humanitarian Dialogue Center. And, and Martin said, look, I established this humanitarian negotiation unit within my office because out of the recognition that um, there are many difficult actors we have to negotiate with to gain access to for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in, in need of support. And that when we open up those relations, sometimes political openings open up that if channeled correctly, might actually be able to help end uh, some of the, these uh, violent conflicts. But he said, I'm gonna tell you two stories and then I have a proposition for you and I could tell you 50. He said, first, when I want to send somebody from this negotiation unit, when I want to deploy them, it takes 21 days for the system here to get a ticket issued, an airplane ticket issued. Um, he said, second, the last time that one of these key negotiators was in Kabul, he was invited by maybe the most important, or one of the most senior Taliban leaders to stay in his family compound. Um, this was the result of 15 years of trust building. And so the negotiator called Martin and Martin said, you have to do this. Uh, but when they hung up the phone, the mission on the ground wouldn't allow him to stay there. So he went back to his five-star hotel uh, in Kabul. And Martin's proposition was, I want to find a way to deploy and mobilize these negotiators with much greater flexibility and adaptability. Uh, I want to partner with an organization like yours. So we piloted this with one of those negotiators over this last year. We've learned a lot of lessons. It's been incredibly valuable, um, both in terms of what it was intended to do but also in connecting some of the community peace building work that our teams support around the world to some of these political processes. And so we're now trying to look at how can that now be institutionalized, that kind of partnership between that unit and an NGO. It's a novel and new thing. So there are a million ways in which it could get destroyed within a big institution like the UN before it even gets born. But there are ways in which if we each look at our respective strengths and weaknesses, we might be able to strengthen you know, the overall system. And the last thing is really who's driving this peace building work. There's one of the biggest pushes, not just in the peace building sector, but international development uh, generally and philanthropy has been localization or supporting those who are most proximate to a problem uh, in terms of them having the decision-making um, uh, uh, authority of how to solve that problem. Uh, and I think in conflict and peace building in particular, uh, local is, is not enough. Uh, I think it's really critical to support multi-partial teams. And by multi-partial, I mean not impartial or neutral, but teams and networks that are drawn from across the dividing lines, um, whether they be ethnic, political, generational, gender, uh, uh, religious, whatever that might be. And that might very well be a single local civil society organization that has made the effort to build those networks. It might be a coalition of local actors who have taken the time to build that kind of multi-partial team and coalition. Um, but it's not enough to just be local. Uh, I was talking to the head of, not the head, but someone very senior at one of the largest foundations that everybody here would know about this. And they have a presence in Nigeria, as an example. Um, but when you look at it, Literally more than 90% of the decision makers in that office, in terms of programming and funding, are Christian. Um, this is in a country with almost 50% of the population is Muslim. I think it's the fifth most populous Muslim country in the world. Um, um, that They're all local. Uh, I don't think they're gonna have the insights without doing a lot of work to really be building bridges across the dividing lines. So those are three things that I would highlight that I think are important for us to really confront and shift. Talking about nuance. Right? 
That's, uh, that's what I'm picking up. Okay, Ambassador Moose, George, you uh, have an incredible distinguished career uh, as a diplomat, and I'm gonna actually tell a little funny story. About two years ago, we were on a panel together speaking to students at, I think, GW, and uh, you said, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be relaxing more. I think you were getting off the board even of USIP, and I chuckled and said, yeah, right. So how's that going, uh, that relaxing? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, actually, if, if, I, if one has to be somewhere doing something, I can't think of a better place to be or better work to be doing. Um, but to your point, as you know well, I began my career working the other side of 23rd Street across the street of the State Department. So it's hard to take the, 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 the diplomatic out of the former diplomat as much as I'm trying to improve. Um, but I'm also, as you know, deeply committed to this field of peace building. I had the pleasure of serving on the board of Search for Common Ground for 14 years. I served on the board here at USIP for, for 16. So I have great respect for, appreciation for, I value greatly the work of this community and have tried in various ways to contribute to it. Um, but I'm also mindful that in every community, uh, sometimes we get to be complacent and we get to uh, be too comfortable with the practices uh, of the past and the things we know how to do well. And I'm also mindful of the fact that, you know, our world has changed dramatically. Certainly in, since the late 60s when I joined the State Department and even in the last 40 years, even in the last two decades. Um, and we can go through and enumerate all those changes. You know, the, the reality is that uh, you know, we have more conflict going on in the world today than we did 20 years ago, reversing the trend from the 1980s and 1990s. We have a conflict landscape that is far more cluttered and fractured than it was 20 years ago. We have far more actors in that space. Uh, some seeking, uh, we think with good intent to play a, a positive roles, but others we know quite dramatically are uh, doing just the opposite. We have, uh, we have this, this immediacy now between the connection between local conflicts and global conflicts. And we've got a war going on in Europe, which has metastasized in all kinds of ways and is manifesting itself in conflicts all around the world. I think of my, the part of the world that I know best, which is Africa, where you see the Russia-Ukraine conflict playing out in the likes of the Africa Corps, the former Wagner group and what they're doing there. And that's not the only place in the, in the world that's happening. Uh, and then we have these extraordinary new disruptors and drivers that we are dealing with. You know, even within the last 20 years, you know, Search was a pioneer in the, in the use of media and social media for peace building. But we also know that those those technologies and those platforms are being very effectively exploited by the folks who are trying to do evil in the world. Um, in fact, that it is far easier to exploit those technologies and those platforms for that purpose. And then we layer on top of all of that, the realities of the new global shocks, climate being principal among them and the impact that has on food production, on health, on migration, and all the rest. And so that conflict landscape is far more complicated than it used to be. And that's not to say the old, you know, the old drivers of conflict are still there. The whole old challenges of social cohesion, of economic inequity, of religious, social, political differences, all those things have not changed. It's simply that we have now layered on top of them whole new complexities of conflict and drivers of conflict. And so, again, thinking as one who spent those 37 years across the street as a diplomat, I have great empathy and sympathy for our, my colleagues and friends in the diplomatic and national security space who are trying to figure out how to deal with these things. And I also have to say, I have to question whether we as peace builders have indeed kept pace with the, the rapidity of and the complexity of those changes. 
Now, I am a firm believer in the concepts of inclusive peace building. We practice that every day here at the US Institute of Peace. But it's not entirely clear to me that proposing to my friends across the street that we bring more women and youth and others to the negotiating table, whether they see that as an adequate response to dealing with the likes of Al Qaeda in the Maghreb or the morphed version of the Wagner group in the Africa Corps. Um, and so I think first and foremost, we need to be a bit more sympathetic to the challenges that they are facing in their space. And I think we have to be a bit more questioning of ourselves as to whether or not the solutions that we are offering are in fact relevant to the challenges with which they are dealing. Um, and I hope, frankly, that in the next two and a half days, that some of you, all of you, will find occasion to ask the, those questions uh, and to figure out how, because if we don't answer those questions probably, we're not going to succeed in the first part of your agenda, Liz, which was how do we more urgently and compellingly tell the story of the value of the work that we as a community do? Okay, so we hear a lot of times uh, there's so many crises, there's so many conflicts, how, how, that naivete about peace building and conflict prevention. How do we convince the public, uh, policymakers, how do we convince them that you know, prevention has to be a first priority, that it has to be centered? And more importantly, because we are getting there, we're getting that in there, you gotta implement it. What does it look like practically? So Peter, back to you, what are some very practical steps that we could be taking? Yeah, thanks, thanks Liz, uh, and, and thanks for the previous speakers. I mean, um, just, just reiterating that indeed the context in which we operate has changed. And I think the challenges that are confronted, that we are confronted with, uh, have become also increasingly intertwined and interlinked. And that, that adds to the necessity of, of bringing in a thorough review of the toolbox that we that we're utilizing as, as peace builders and, and, and working in the field of conflict prevention. But at the same time, I think the element that that we have been maybe not sufficiently including in our in our I mean, yes, we have been communicating what, what we have been doing and we have been using social media, we have been telling stories, but we have not been able to to translate the need for prioritization and resource of conflict prevention and peace building in a thorough way that both the governments and, and high level leaders acknowledge and integrate this into their policies but also the general public about seeing the need and seeing being convinced of um, also the, the cost effectiveness of, 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 of uh, investing in prevention and peace building. And I think that is, that is where a challenge lies that we have to, um, I mean, if you want to accelerate um, and support prioritization of conflict prevention and peace building, and also provide adequate and predictable and sustainable financing to it, you also need to be able to generate something of a support trust building element in it that that both policymakers but also the general public see that that the investment in that although it is longer term longer term strategy longer term work is an investment that 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 um, that is needed and I think that the policymakers currently and if I speak from my own country or the European context at this point in time the priority lies on very short term quick fixes uh, or potential fixes, which are perceived fixes of problems of, uh, of, of uh, things that, that the societies in Europe are confronted with. But these quick fixes are not solving the problem. It's not addressing the root causes of why, for instance, people migrate or why conflicts emerge or why uh, crises emerge and, and, and turn into violent conflicts. And I think that. That storytelling also about how, in a holistic sense, things are intertwined, interlinked, and 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 should be um, elaborated, is also a story that we as peace builders should 
in a more greater um, uh, attention should focus on in telling and, and look at the interlinkages and, and also explain that that investments in conflict prevention is also not a standalone issue. I mean, prevention of conflicts is also linked to how we can provide health uh, care or how we can address poverty issues or how we can uh, conf be confronting the, the challenges of climate change. So that's, it, it is a different kind of narrative, it's a different kind of interaction with related fields that are uh, also pressing challenges upon uh, local peace builders and, and, and local actors trying to secure a, a, a sustainable future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Shamal? Uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more with the call for more innovative and creative approaches. I think, uh, and, and sometimes it's just a lack of political will. So the question is really around how do you generate that political will? I mean, I, to take, again, Israel-Palestine as an example, I don't think, you know, it gets talked about all the time is it's just so complex, it's just so complex, it's just so complex. I think it is complex and, and I think it's made a lot more complex when some of the most basic elements of peace building are ignored for decades. So it's, yeah. it's not so much that, well, we have to, yes, we have to try new things. Part of it is we just have to keep trying what we've been doing uh, uh, actually uh, with a lot more political will generated and a lot more pressure put on to, 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 to mobilize. But, but having said that, I think what's interesting is in the, in, in at least what we're seeing is more recogni recognition in philanthropic circles and among regular citizens, particularly in Western countries where there's a lot of philanthropy here, here in the US and, and elsewhere of the need for prevention. Uh, not necessarily, and I'm talking about foundations, family foundations, massive, big foundations, uh, everything in between, not because they're adopting peace building as their mission, but out of what I'm seeing is two recognitions. One, many of them are realizing over the last 10 years that their societies aren't nearly as stable as they thought they were. And they're realizing, oh, conflict isn't just something over there. Actually, you know, we're falling apart here at home, whether home is the Netherlands or the US or wherever it might be. The second is, they are supporting all kinds of causes, climate causes, women's rights, uh, education, and they're realizing that if we don't deal with conflict dynamics, our progress on these things are severely blocked or even reversed after decades of progress. That recognition, which we've been, many in the peace building field have been advocating for and forward thinking policymakers have been from inside advocating for, for a long time, is becoming much more of, it, it's a lot easier to make the case to a broader public that this is a priority because they're living it every day and they're realizing it. it. Hasn't necessarily led to a flood of new investment in the field, but I think it is leading to more engagement and over time it will lead to more of that uh, investment. And again, that I think that private sector and that philanthropic investment is so critical because it enables you not to replace the support from various governments, but to really complement it ways that enable you to do very creative uh, things. That UN partnership I mentioned, we never could have gotten going if it wasn't for three forward thinking foundations. I think the last thing I would say is to come back to this, the, the point I was making about multipartiality and, and the importance of, of joint leadership. I think with some of the technological developments that George and others have alluded to and, and President McAleese was talking about, I think it's very difficult, I think it's an understatement to say it's very difficult to be a unifying leader today. I would almost say that it's impossible that the age of the unifying individual leader is dead for a while. Um, because it's just so, I had the privilege over the last few months, I'm name dropping a little bit, but I was so excited. I had the privilege to, to meet with uh, President Obama and a couple of weeks after that with um, uh, Jacinda Ardern, the, the former president of New Zealand who had um, uh, took her office at the age of 37. And one, th one of the things that was interesting to me in listening to them is they were both talking about, these are people who ran and won elections on, on platforms of unity and unification and both reflected very openly the degree to which they felt that they had failed to unify their countries and obama made reference to uh the speech he gave on the 50th anniversary of the march from selma to montgomery which the republican pollster frank luntz has said was the most unifying speech in terms of how much it resonated across republican and democratic lines and obama knew this once had told him this and yet he said you know if you polled the same people today just a few years later he said i bet you 50 percent of those people think i'm the antichrist and I just, I think it's, um, and so if that's, the, if that's the case, if people of that level of political skill, I'd love to see a conversation between them and President McAleese, but if people of that skill and genuine desire to unify 
are struggling that much in a world where it's so easy to sow dissension, sow misinformation, sow fear into populations where small extremes can have a big impact on mainstreams. I think the best way to counter that is more coalition building, more joint leadership, more multi-partial teams, more teams of rivals in governance. I think it's not just a nice to have, it's increasingly necessary. And this goes way beyond the peace building field. I think when, when the TED people have their talks, they should do more TED dialogues, like the, the one that went viral this year between the Israeli and the Palestinian. When people are running leadership programs, they shouldn't just support individual leaders, they should have people apply based on their collective constituency to come in as pairs, Muslim, Jewish, Republican, Democrat, Hutu, Tutsi, whatever it might be. We, there needs to be, and I think there's a real opportunity for that, going back to my first point, which is because more and more people outside of government and policy are realizing if we don't figure this out, everything else is mortgaged, everything else is, is, is unattainable. Now collective, again, you're going back to that collective piece. And if we pull together, we have more agency than we think. And we really, um, I've talked with a number of you about this. We could learn something from the humanitarian sector. You know, they really pulled together uh, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, they, put together this humanitarian council, and it's one of the things that we're looking at and pushing for, um, you know, to force us to do what Peter did, to call me up and say, hey, this isn't working. We have to work together. But something that we, you and I talked about last night, George, uh, at dinner was, uh, you know, we are getting these statements by President Biden, by the UN Secretary General, the Germans even put it on page 40, put it in their new security uh, policy, but it's not trickling down. How do you get these great prevention promises and words to trickle down into the bureaucracy? No, excellent question. And, and, and so let's start, Liz, with you know, this landscape isn't as gloomy as, as we've sort of painted it thus far. The fact of the matter is that the Alliance and USIP had an enormous success just a couple of years ago, right? Uh, which was totally unexpected, that uh, growing out of a task force, a senior study group that uh, was co-hosted by USIP and a couple of other think tanks around town, came this consensus around the notion of fragility and how it was core and central to the challenges we were facing uh, in a whole range of issues. And lo and behold, within a matter of a few months, this community came together, succeeded in getting the Congress to pass on a bipartisan basis, a major piece of legislation called the Global Fragility Act, right? And not only that, then um, to have got, got funding to support that initiative. Uh, so it's not as though the, there is, things are entirely bleak and, and, and dismal out there. But I will say, and I do appreciate, and frankly in some respects share, the frustration with what has happened since. That the promise of the Global Fragility Act has, I think in the minds of many of us, has not been fully realized. But what should that, what, what message should we take from that? I think one of the messages is, that maybe we need to regroup around what it is, how do we sustain and support this initiative so that we can demonstrate that in fact the conceptualization that the original idea still has merit. And it does have merit. Uh, I think in some respects uh, we allowed, uh, we, we have not focused properly on where it applies and where it doesn't. Um, I think it, arguably when we, we said that, you know, it, we should test Sudan as the proposition for the Global Fragility Act. That was a serious miscalculation because Sudan was not fragile. It was broken by the time we got there. Same, similarly with, uh, with Libya, um, similarly with Haiti. So I think we need to be much more focused on how do we make the most of, of this tool, this instrument that has been created with bipartisan support on the Hill. Clearly it resonated with a lot of people. And we also have to have conversations with our colleagues, State Department and elsewhere, about uh, it was intended to be a, 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 an agile, flexible tool, an instrument that was resp responsive, uh, that we could use uh, to respond quickly to situations. And as often happens in Washington, 
it's become highly bureaucratized. And, and we need to figure out how we encourage and support our colleagues to do that. But I think this is not just for us. It's not for just for us sitting here in Washington. This is a whole of community effort, a conversation. It's, we have to demonstrate that we are doing our work so that others will see that there is a value in investing in the work that we are doing. OK. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I don't know if we have a, do we have a mic writer? Thank you. Uh, Paul Miller, uh, Lutheran World Relief, part of Course International, and also I'm an adjunct professor, so I can criticize at night what I do during the day. This is an excellent presentation. President McAleese said, don't miss religion. But something else I'm not hearing is, what was that folk singer song? Masters of War, the dark side of globalization, war economies, gold, coltan, poppies, endangered animals. I'm not hearing weapons exports that leave a dock in Virginia that go across the border to Mexico. I'm not hearing that. I, I'm not part of the peace building community directly yet. I'm not hearing discussions about the things that really potentiate and supercharge the bad actors. Um, I'm just wondering if there is a, a response or there is a lot of work going on here that I'm not hearing about over. Talking about the root causes. Root causes. Is there another? We want to take another question? This one over here. Yes. No. <laughs> Lynn, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lynn Carter, Alliance for Peace Building. Prevention seems to me to require a runway of some kind. And in many of these environments, you just mentioned Libya, there doesn't look like there's much of a runway. So where do we determine where we can use prevention, where we need a different toolkit entirely? And when I look at prevention in places that are really conflict affected, they're kind of micro programs and there's no scale to them. So how do you even hope to get traction in, in that with prevention strategies? Thanks, someone else. Okay, why don't we take these two questions over to you all. Um, well, gosh, both both great questions on, on the runway one. And I think that's what I was kind of trying to get at. Um, th th there are situations which are, which do not lend themselves to the kinds of tools that we were seeking to build within the, the GFA. And we need to recognize that. But there are others where we have opportunity. There is runway, there is possibility. I would look, for example, at coastal West Africa as one of those places. Uh, there's still some runway, even though that runway is getting shorter and shorter, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a place where we should have been working for years because we could see, we could see what was happening in the Sahel, neighboring countries, and what was coming towards the coastal West Africa. But there is still runway there. I would argue that Mozambique is another one of those places where notwithstanding the current conflict, there is still runway, there's still possibility for something. But to the other question, you know, yes, you were, you were speaking to exactly what I was trying to get at, which is that we need to understand the ways in which conflict has changed and the drivers of conflict have changed. You know, we are at the moment, all of us pursuing this dream of a green economy uh, and our cell phones and our Teslas uh, and ignoring the reality that in so doing, we are uh, un underwriting the exploitation of critical minerals in extremely fragile parts of the world, contributing to local conflicts, economic inequ inequity, which is going to plague us for years. And we need to be talking about that. We need to be talking about, well, what is our response? to how mining gets done in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. How are we going to address the governance issues around the mining of critical minerals in those parts of the world? What is it, how are we going to address the economic and environmental impacts 
that are, are craving, rightly so, for a more sustainable uh, economy is, gonna, is already producing and generating in other parts of the world. And if we don't address that, how are you gonna address the competition between China and the United States over uh, in the search for those critical minerals? So it, we need at least to be able to talk to people in positions of policymakers and national security folks to explain how our solutions are relevant to the challenges that they are facing. And I think there are ways in which we can have those conversations. Shamo Peter. Um, I, I, I think that um, without wanting to cheapen the term, I think we're, we're we are to some extent, all living in conflict zones now. I, I think that the, in, in the sense that you look at the, so you know, probably a lot of people saw the Carnegie report on polarization, with polarization defined as uh, not just you know rankest, rank, uh, you know, discord, but uh, uh, but where um, parties see the other uh, as an existential threat. Um, so there's no such thing, all these qualifiers on polarization. Is it toxic polarization? Is it effective polarization? Is what a, there's no good polarization if you define polarization as you see the other party as an existential threat. Nothing good comes of that. And what Carnegie was reporting was that looking back to 1900, every region of the world with the exception of Oceania, I think it is, that, uh, which tells us what we all need to, all you knew we should all live in South Pacific, but what they had was at uh, higher levels of polarization than at any time since 1900, with the exception of Europe uh, before World War I and World War II. Uh, and that the spike in the level of polarization over the last 10 to 15 years was at unprecedented or nearly unprecedented levels in every region of the world. So when I think about the question of runway, where should one do this work? Um, or I look at the work that, you know, we made a decision many years ago that we wanted to focus our efforts in places where um, the, the most consequential conflicts, where millions of lives were at stake, either for good or in uplifting lives if, if conflict dynamics could be transformed. Um, the distinction between pre-conflict, conflict, and post-conflict, don't get me wrong, I don't want to say that it's irrelevant. If you're living in the middle of where bombs are dropping, clearly you know, there, are defi there are definitions here. But, but societies are shifting, in my view, back and forth between these dynamics all of the time. Uh, and in some of the worst cases, I gave a couple examples of the grain deal, the hostage accord, whatever. Um, it is in the midst of the most hellish violent conflicts sometimes that new relationships are born or new opportunities or there's finally a realization that we can't go back to where we were. I don't know, and I certainly wouldn't predict because of how, I mean, you know, uh, horrible the ongoing war is, but, you know, I don't know if we'll be able to get a legitimate and inclusive political process out of the current war, what's going on in, in the Middle East, right? Um, I don't think we were any closer to an inclusive political process on October 6th. So what does that say to us about, you know, where was the political will to have a genuinely inclusive political process for 20 years? Uh, where was the international pressure and inducements to mobilize that? And so, I, uh, budget time is always a time when you have to make decisions, so you have to prioritize. I'm not, I recognize that. But in terms of where is there an opportunity to transform conflict into cooperation, it's not always when things on the level seem stable, in my view. It's sometimes, is, and, and in fact, that partnership with the UN, I'm sorry I keep mentioning it, but one of the things that, if you look at what Martin said when he was leaving office in his closing statement, he made a very strong case that this term humanitarian diplomacy was both a symptom and a potential contribution to an underlying problem or solution to an underlying problem, which is the failure of political processes. So now we have to rely on humanitarian actors to be negotiating access. And when they're negotiating access, suddenly they realize that there are maybe some Al-Shabaab fighters who are willing to put down their weapons if they knew they wouldn't be tortured. Or they have a conversation with the Taliban that opens up that there might be a bigger political possibility there than people realized. And so um, I think we should be making the most of all of these levers. I think there should be a lot more investment in humanitarian diplomacy. Uh, I think we shouldn't necessarily assume uh, that the best places to do this work is where war hasn't already broken out. Um, but then I do understand decisions need to be made <laughs> where, budgets, where budgets go. But Chamo, you raise a really good point. We have to look inside ourselves, as I tell my kids a lot of time, and reflect on their behavior. We, as a community, didn't collectively say anything when it came to Israel-Palestine. 
We were all very quiet, especially here in the United States. And well, that's something we need to look inside ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. I think if I would look at uh, what are the missions and the habits of organizations in the peace building sector? Um, what is the theory of change that they have? Which are organizations that are committed to policy advocacy and making clear statements about what should and shouldn't happen? What are the organizations that are committed to building multi-partial teams on the ground and deferring everything to those teams, including what headquarters should or shouldn't say? Uh, not saying something if you're the first organization is very different from not saying something if you're the second organization. But it's a conversation we need to have. Peter? Yeah, maybe, maybe a few reflections on the, on the runway question. Um, I, I, I mean, the issue of scale is, is, a, is, a, is a relevant one, but it's also the issue of connections and making the connection between the, na the national and the local level and also uh, forging a change at the international level. And I think that convergence and bringing, bringing various spheres together is, is something that we also should strive for. And I think in, in what we hear from our members across the globe, and, and then maybe zooming in on, on, the, on the coastal West Africa region, because that was mentioned as an example, where also with the Global Fragility Act, there was, and there is still, I think, an opportunity for potential innovative and, 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 and partnership uh, approach uh, work. Uh, but we need to we need to also look at the national and, and local level uh, for um, investment and, and building an ecosystem for early warning early action i think that is where, where peace building at the local level needs to be relating itself to and also needs to be investing much more um with, with resources but also with, with capacity strengthening for actually also being able to respond to challenges as they emerge what we see happening at the same time in terms of I mean, making the connection with the international level, that the political will at the international level to invest in these kind of uh, peace building and, and local conflict prevention uh, activities is not always there. And that is, that is an, another line of activities and, and, and action that needs support is trying to have this continuous dialogue with, with representatives of, of donors and, and foundations who actually continuously invest and, and, and strengthen their investment, but also invest for the long term, because this change will not happen overnight. It will not happen overnight that the situation in West Africa and the challenges that the region is confronted with will change by bringing in a global fragility act. I mean, you need more actors, you need more um, um, actors that are willing to take up that challenge uh, and also make the connection with the national and local level. To be able to to fix that 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 ecosystem uh, and, and make change happen there. Okay, so I know we're at time. Uh, I know there's a bunch more questions. Feel free to ask them during the break. What I'm hearing a lot of is this collective action, and we're going to be. We've already called on many of you. We're going to be calling many more of you, uh, so we can work collectively. Uh, the nuance. Uh, the issue around being pragmatic and how do we really focus in on the practical and actionable way that we get these prevention promises implemented. And it's a hard slog. We're going to hear more about it this, uh, with the Global Fragility Act later today and, and also with the UN. Uh, we have, you know, some important meetings coming up as well. So we'll be talking about that later on. But now, have a wonderful break and have some great sessions that are coming up. So thank you so much.